So let's talk about dopamine. Most people have heard of dopamine and we hear all the time now about dopamine hits, but actually there's no such thing as a dopamine hit. And actually the way that your body uses dopamine is to have a baseline level of dopamine, meaning an amount of dopamine that's circulating in your brain and body all the time. And that turns out to be important for how you feel generally, whether or not you're in a good mood, motivated, et cetera. And you also can experience peaks in dopamine above baseline. Now this has a very specific name in the neurobiology literature, so-called tonic and phasic release of dopamine. And I'll explain what that means in a couple of minutes. But if you remember nothing else from this episode, please remember this, that when you experience something or you crave something really desirable, really exciting to you, very pleasurable, what happens afterwards is your baseline level of dopamine drops, okay? So these peaks in dopamine, they influence how much dopamine will generally be circulating afterward. And you might think, oh, a big peak in dopamine. After that, I'm gonna feel even better because I just had this great event. Not the case. What actually happens is that your baseline level of dopamine drops. And I will explain the precise mechanism for that, okay? In the neuroscience literature, we refer to this as tonic and phasic release of dopamine. Tonic being the low level baseline that's always there circulating, released into your brain all the time. And then phasic, these peaks that ride above that baseline. And those two things interact. And this is really important. I'm gonna teach you the underlying neurobiology, but even if you have no background in biology, I promise to make it all clear. I'll explain the terms and what they mean. And I'm excited to teach you about dopamine because dopamine has everything to do with how you feel right now as you're listening to this. It has everything to do with how you will feel an hour from now, it has everything to do with your level of motivation and your level of desire and your willingness to push through effort. If ever you've interacted with somebody who just doesn't seem to have any drive, they've given up, or if you've interacted with somebody who seems to have endless drive and energy, what you are looking at there in those two circumstances is without question, a difference in the level of dopamine circulating in their system. There will be other factors too, but the level of dopamine is the primary determinant of how motivated we are, how excited we are, how outward facing we are, and how willing we are to lean into life and pursue things. Dopamine is what we call a neuromodulator. Neuromodulators are different than neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are involved in the dialogue between neurons, nerve cells, and neurotransmitters tend to mediate local communication. Just imagine two people talking to one another at a concert. That communication between them is analogous to the communication carried out by neurotransmitters, whereas neuromodulators influence the communication of many neurons. Imagine a bunch of people dancing where it's a coordinated dance involving 10 or 20 or hundreds of people. Neuromodulators are coordinating that dance. In the nervous system, what this means is that dopamine release changes the probability that certain neural circuits will be active and that other neural circuits will be inactive, okay? So it modulates a bunch of things all at once. And that's why it's so powerful at shifting not just our levels of energy, but also our mindset, also our feelings of whether or not we can or cannot accomplish something. So how does dopamine work and what does it do? Well, first of all, it is not just responsible for pleasure. It is responsible for motivation and drive primarily at the psychological level, also for craving. Those three things are sort of the same, motivation, drive, and craving. It also controls time perception. And we will get deep into how dopamine can modulate time perception and how important it is that everybody be able to access increases in dopamine at different time scales. This turns out to be important to not end up addicted to substances, but it also turns out to be very important to sustain effort and be a happy person over long periods of time, which I think most everybody wants. It certainly is adaptive in life to be able to do that. Dopamine is also vitally important for movement. I'll explain the neural circuits for dopamine and mindset and dopamine in movement in a moment, but in diseases like Parkinson's, or Louis body's dementia, which is similar to Parkinson's in many ways, there's a depletion or death of dopamine neurons at a particular location in the brain, which leads to shaky movements, challenges in speaking, challenges in particular in initiating movement, 
And because dopamine is depleted elsewhere too, people with Parkinson's and Louis, and Louis, excuse me, Louis body dementia also experience drops in motivation and affect, meaning mood, they tend to get depressed and so on. When those people are properly treated, they can, not always, but they can recover some fluidity of movement, some ability to initiate movement. And almost without question, those people feel better psychologically, not just because they can move, but also because dopamine impacts mood and motivation. So what are the underlying neural circuits? For those of you that are not interested in biology and specific nomenclature, you can tune out now if you want, but it's actually pretty straightforward. You have two main neural circuits in the brain that dopamine uses in order to exert all its effects. The first one is a pathway that goes from this area in the what's called the ventral tegmentum. That's a fancy, but ventral just means bottom. And tegmentum actually means floor. So it's at the bottom of the brain and it's the ventral part of the floor. So it's really low in the back of the brain, the ventral tegmentum. And it goes from the ventral tegmentum to what's called the ventral striatum and the prefrontal cortex. Now that's a lot of language, but basically what we call this is the mesocorticolimbic pathway. This is the pathway by which dopamine influences motivation, drive, and craving. It involves structures that some of you may have heard of before, things like nucleus accumbens and the prefrontal cortex. This is the pathway that really gets disrupted in addictions where in particular, drugs that influence the release of dopamine like cocaine and methamphetamine, we'll talk about those drugs today, they tap into this pathway. But if you are pursuing a partner, a boyfriend or girlfriend, if you're pursuing a degree in school, if you're pursuing a finish line in a race, you are tapping into this so-called mesocorticolimbic pathway. This is the classic reward pathway in all mammals. The other pathway emerges from an area in the brain called the substantia nigra, so-called because the cells in that area are dark and the substantia nigra connects to an area of the brain called the dorsal striatum. This is not surprisingly called the nigrostriatal pathway. For those of you who have never done any neuroanatomy, I'm gonna teach you a little trick right now. Everything in neuroanatomy, the first part of a word tells you where the neurons are. And then the second part tells you where they are connecting to. So when I say nigrostriatal pathway, it means that the neurons are in substantia nigra and they connect to the striatum, nigrostriatal pathway. So while it's a lot of language, there is some logic there. Okay, so we've got these two pathways, one mainly for movement, right? This is the substantia nigra to dorsal striatum. And we've got this other pathway, the so-called mesocortical limbic pathway that's for reward, reinforcement, and motivation. I want you to remember that there are two pathways. If you don't remember the two pathways in detail, that's fine, but please remember that there are two pathways because that turns out to be important later. Now, the other thing to understand about dopamine is that the way that dopamine is released in the brain and body can differ, meaning it can be very local or it can be more broad. Now, most of you have probably heard of synapses. Synapses are the little spaces between neurons and basically neurons, nerve cells, communicate with one another by making each other electrically active or by making each other less electrically active. So here's how this works. You can imagine one nerve cell and another nerve cell with a little gap between them, a little synapse. And the way that one nerve cell causes the next nerve cell to fire, what we call fire really means to become electrically active, is that it vomits out these little packets, what we call vesicles. They're little bubbles filled with a chemical. When that chemical enters the synapse, it, some of it docks or parks on the other side in the other neuron. And by virtue of electrical changes in the, what we call the postsynaptic neuron, that chemical will make that neuron more electrically active or less electrically active. Dopamine can do that like any other neurotransmitter or neuromodulator. So it can have one neuron influence another neuron, but dopamine can also engage in what's called a volumetric release. Volumetric release is like a giant vomit that gets out to 50 or 100 or even thousands of cells. So there's local release, what we call synaptic release, and then there's volumetric release. So volumetric release is like dumping all this dopamine out into the system. So 
Dopamine is incredible because it can change the way that our neural circuits work at a local scale and at a very broad scale. And for those of you that are only interested in tools, like how do I get more dopamine? Let me tell you, this part is really important because if you were to take a drug or supplement that increases your level of dopamine, you are influencing both the local release of dopamine and volumetric release. This relates back to the baseline of dopamine and the big peak above baseline. And that turns out to be important. And I'll just allude to why it's important. Many drugs and indeed many supplements that increase dopamine will actually make it harder for you to sustain dopamine release over long periods of time and to achieve those peaks that most of us are craving when we are in pursuit of things. Why? Because if you get both volumetric release, the dumping out of dopamine everywhere, and you're getting local release, what it means is that the difference between the peak and baseline is likely to be smaller. And this is very important, how satisfying or exciting or pleasurable a given experience is doesn't just depend on the height of that peak. It depends on the height of that peak relative to the baseline. So if you increase the baseline and you increase the peak, you're not going to achieve more and more pleasure from things. I'll talk about how to leverage this information in a little bit, but just increasing your dopamine, yes, it will make you excited for all things. It will make you feel very motivated, but it will also make that motivation very short lived. So there's a better way to increase your dopamine. There's a better way to optimize this peak to baseline ratio. For now, what we've talked about is two main neural circuits, one for movement and one for motivation and craving with dopamine. And we've talked about two main modes of communication between neurons with dopamine. One is this local synaptic release. One is more volumetric release. And in the back of your mind, you can relate this back to, again, this baseline versus peaks above baseline. So that's a description of what we would call the spatial effects or the spatial aspects of dopamine. I said, this connects to that, that connects to this. You can get local or more broad volumetric release. What about the duration of release or the duration of action for dopamine? Well, dopamine is unique among chemicals in the brain because dopamine, unlike a lot of chemicals in the brain, works through what are called G protein coupled receptors. And for those of you that are about to pass out from the amount of detail, just hang in there with me. It's really not complicated. There are two ways that neurons can communicate, or mainly two ways. There are a third and a fourth, but mostly neurons communicate by two modes. One are what we call fast electrical synapses, ionotropic conduction, all right? You don't need to know what that means, but basically one neuron activates another neuron and little holes open up in that neuron and ions rush in. Sodium is the main ion salt by which one neuron influences the electrical activity of another neuron because sodium ions contain a charge, okay? There are other things like chloride and potassium. If you're interested in looking this up, just look up ionic conductances in the action potential, or I could do a post on it sometime and we could go into detail, but just understand that when neurons want to influence each other, they can do it by way of this fast ionotropic conduction. This is a really quick way for one neuron to influence the next. Dopamine doesn't communicate that way. Dopamine is slower. It works through what are called G-protein coupled receptors. So what happens is dopamine is released in these little vesicles that I've mentioned before, get vomited out into the synapse. Some of that dopamine will bind to the so-called postsynaptic neuron. It'll bind to the next neuron. And then it sets off a cascade. It's kind of like a bucket brigade of one thing getting handed off to the next, to the next, to the next. It's G-protein coupled receptors. And anytime you hear about these GPCRs or G-protein coupled receptors, pay attention because they're really interesting. They're slow, but they also can have multiple cascades of effects. They can impact even gene expression at some level. They can change what a cell actually becomes. They can change how well or how poorly that cell will respond to the same signal in the future. So dopamine works through this slower process, these G-protein coupled receptors. And so its effects tend to take a while in order to occur. This aspect of 
Dopamine transmission is important because it now underscores two things. One, there's two pathways for dopamine to communicate, one for movement, one for motivation and craving. There's two spatial scales at which dopamine can operate synaptically or volumetrically, and dopamine can have slow effects, really slow effects, or even very long lasting effects. And it even can control gene expression. It can actually change the way that cells behave. One thing that's not often discussed about dopamine, but is extremely important to know, is that dopamine doesn't work on its own. Neurons that release dopamine co-release glutamate. Glutamate is a neurotransmitter and it's a neurotransmitter that is excitatory, meaning it stimulates neurons to be electrically active. So now, even if you don't know any cell biology, you should start to gain a picture that Dopamine is responsible for movement, motivation, and drive. It does that through two pathways, but also the dopamine stimulates action in general because it releases this excitatory neurotransmitter. It tends to make certain neurons that are nearby or even that are far away because of volumetric release, it tends to make those more active. So dopamine is really stimulating. And indeed, we say that dopaminergic transmission or dopamine tends to stimulate sympathetic arousal. Sympathetic doesn't have anything to do with sympathy. It just simply means that it tends to increase our levels of alertness. It tends to bring an animal or a human into a state of more alertness, readiness, and desire to pursue things outside the confines of its skin. So if I were to just put a really simple message around dopamine, it would be there's a molecule in your brain and body that when released tends to make you look outside yourself, pursue things outside yourself, and to crave things outside yourself. The pleasure that arrives from achieving things also involves dopamine, but is mainly the consequence of other molecules. But if ever you felt lethargic and like just lazy and you had no motivation or drive, that's a low dopamine state. If ever you felt really excited, motivated, even if you were a little scared to do something, Maybe you did your first skydive or you're about to do your first skydive or you're about to do some public speaking and you really don't wanna screw it up. You are in a high dopamine state. Dopamine is a universal currency in all mammals, but especially in humans for moving us toward goals and how much dopamine is in our system at any one time compared to how much dopamine was in our system a few minutes ago and how much we remember enjoying a particular experience of the past, that dictates your so-called quality of life and your desire to pursue things. This is really important. Dopamine is a currency and it's the way that you track pleasure. It's the way that you track success. It's the way that you track whether or not you are doing well or doing poorly. And that is subjective. But if your dopamine is too low, you will not feel motivated. If your dopamine is really high, you will feel motivated. And if your dopamine is somewhere in the middle, how you feel depends on whether or not you had higher dopamine a few minutes ago or lower dopamine. This is important. Your experience of life and your level of motivation and drive depends on how much dopamine you have relative to your recent experience. This is again, something that's just not accounted for in the simple language of dopamine hits, okay? A simple way to envision dopamine hits is every time you do something you like, you eat a piece of chocolate, dopamine hit. You look at your Instagram, dopamine hit. You see someone you like, dopamine hit. You know, all these things described as dopamine hits neglect the fact that if you scroll social media and you see something you really like, dopamine hit. Sure, there's an increase in dopamine, but then you get to something else and you go, mm, not that interesting. However, had you arrived at that second thing first, you might think that it was really interesting. If you had arrived to that second Instagram post three days later or four days later, you might find it extremely interesting. Again, how much dopamine you experience from something depends on your baseline level of dopamine when you arrive there and your previous dopamine peaks. Okay, that's super important to understand and it's completely neglected by the general language of dopamine hits. This is why when you repeatedly engage in something that you enjoy, your threshold for enjoyment goes up and up and up. 